Hello, waxers. Welcome to Waxing Let It Go with Mains and Dutch. I'm your host, Neil, and my colleague in Rainford is also Neil. How are, how are we, Neil? Um, as people might be able to tell if they've heard us before, I'm not exactly at my best. So what I did then, we've already recorded an interview, so what I've actually already done um, is we've interviewed the brilliant, legendary Greg Cosell. The issue is I did an interview and Neil interviewed him in two different voices, as you will all find out, as it was Neil and Neil. Not an issue in any way, shape or form. I'm actually thinking of changing my name by Depot. Yeah, it's it's like um, I I had a book signed uh, by Matthew Hoggard a few years ago, and he spelt you know to Neil best wishes Matthew Hoggard, and he spelt Neil N I E L. I thought, well, no, he's won the Ashes, so I'll change my name. That'll just be easier. <laughs> it's just it's just a lot more simple. So they are Max and Nicole. It's NFL style. We still got weird. We still got weird worlds. We're going to go through a few stories that we found that tickled us during the, during the week. Then we've got an absolutely magnificent interview with Greg Cosell. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about free agency, which starts in 40 minutes. However, we were breaking news with Greg during the interview, which was absolutely brilliant. That's one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. Me telling me telling him that Brock Osweiler was signing with the Texans is legendary. Like. Yeah, Although that's... he thinks it was you. But anyway, yeah. that's a different story for another time. That's, that's one for my bucket list. <laughs> so, Dutton, let's get on with the show and let's get on with... Weird world. So don't you say, I've got a couple here. They're just absolutely brilliant. If you don't follow Huffington Post weird news, what are you doing with yourself? Because it's absolutely brilliant. So, this is the headline, Dutton. Russian teenager wins competition to spend a month in a hotel with porn star Ekaterina Makarova. That's just like one teenage, one Russian teenager won the prize of a lifetime. The chance to live in a hotel with a porn star for a month. Former child act- actor Ruslan Schneidlin, 16, was the lucky 100,000 visitor to a games website and subsequently offered the prize of shacking up with adult actress Ekaterina Marikova in Moscow. I didn't believe it at first. I thought it was rubbish, but it turned out to be true. I thanked the website. I was so happy. It's, it's one of those, though, isn't it? I mean, let, let's assume that there is some carnal motive behind this this endeavour. After a month, well, no, after two weeks, you'd be fed up with each other, surely? Even given that it's a porn star? Kate isn't listening and hopefully won't listen to the podcast. I'm looking at pictures of this not, not on a porn website. You wouldn't be bored of this after two weeks, done. You would never be bored of this. She'd be bored of me. That's not my problem, though. It's not my problem. Literally, could not my problem. You know, you're 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 engaged. I'm engaged. They're both of us already. That's not our problem. They they said yes. They have to deal with the consequences of saying yes. True. Do you know what I mean? It's just the way of the world, Dutton. Way of the world. Okay, here we go, Dutton. Next story. What monkey walks into a bar, drinks rum, attacks people with knife. And to be fair. They knew he had a temper, and they kept giving him rum. That's the issue, you see. When when he came in, surely they should have realised this is the one who gets angry when he has the rum. Yeah, Coco, put the knife down. You can have two, and then you've got to go. <laughs> According to reports, the inebriated monkey was acting aggressively towards male patrons in the bar and chasing people before it started stabbing the roof of the establishment with a sharp object. He doesn't like men, you know what I mean? You know, he likes his bitches, and he doesn't like men near them, yeah? Listen, this is brilliant, this, by the way. this is. It was a bar staff oversight that ended with the monkey drinking some rum and taking the knife fire department. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Saul Laurentino told us told the news. An oversight, here's some rum and a knife. What what what, what type of oversight do you want? Yeah. Who, who are you giving that rum and a knife to? Oh, uh, the little fellow over there. Isn't that a monkey? Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. It can't be a monkey. He wouldn't be in a bar. Yeah. He's had three already. <laughs> He's had three. He could drive, to be honest. He's fine, you know what I mean? And you know, you know, he's just he just played pool with just played pool with Dave. He beat him on the black line. Yeah. Dave's not happy. No, no. <laughs> just just magnificent. Like, I just love it. And then Dutton, my favourite story of the week. Washington man accidentally kills himself while taking selfie with his gun, police say. It wasn't the first photo the forty three year old concrete Washington residents had taken with his gun, but it would be the last. So, 
we did he didn't get his name. Fatally shot himself in the face while attempting to take a selfie with what he thought was an unloaded gun. The man the man's girlfriend who was with him when the gun went off. Ooh, that's an image that you don't you don't lose quickly. Told the authorities that the pair had taken several selfies with the gun throughout the day. The man unloaded the gun before each photo session, then replaced the bullets when they were done. So the question you've got to be asking yourself, Don, is he's taken he takes the bullets out and um and then takes a selfie, but thinks, you know what, just in case we're attacked, let's put the bullets back in. Mm. Even though there's a possibility we might take more selfies. What an absolute buffoon. But how do you do it accidentally? Did, did he get his hands mixed up and thought he was pressing the photo button and he's pulled the trigger? That, that's the bit I don't understand. Like, you either pull a trigger or you don't pull a trigger. You don't accidentally pull a trigger, do you? A, a trigger? Button? What was it? A phaser? Or, you know, how, how's he done this? And, and I don't know what gun he's got, but doesn't don't you have to like cock a gun? Do you know what I mean? Don't you have to put it in a position to fire? It doesn't automatically fire. I'm very confused Do- by the whole situation. Like I don't know how I don't know understand guns. I mean, you know, our our, our, gu- our gun laws are much more uh, stringent than America's. As in, we've got some. Mm. Um, so I haven't got one, but you know, I, I don't really want one. When and I'm, if I've got one, I'm not going to take a selfie with it either. If there is a lesson here, it's don't take selfies. Do you want to know something, Don? Do you want to, if we go, so Guy died taking a selfie. This year, 27 people have already died while taking selfies. Selfie-related deaths, Neil. And that, that isn't like, oh, look, Kim Kardashian took a selfie of a naked body, so I've gone on and beat her with a stick. This is Guy tries to take selfie and falls off mountain. Mm. I mean, he shoots the... himself in the face while taking selfie. <clears throat> I mean, statistically, one person has died this year somewhere on Earth as a result of a shark attack, and twenty-seven people have died because of selfies. One person died while swimming. Twenty-seven idiots have now left us. In the, in the Darwinian world, and as we've quite rightly pointed out before, this is actually good. It's a, if, if we think about it strategically, yeah, that's 27 people who now can't procreate. Mm. So, yeah. so what you're actually saying is more people should take selfies? A certain group of people, I've got a list. If we're happy to give them a gun that's loaded and tell them it's unloaded, I'm happy to do that. Don't we? Well, I, I think this, is, this has shown that we don't need a gun. These people will find some way to kill themselves and, and while taking photos of themselves. And boy, have they done. And boy, have mm-hmm. they Something. That's weird world. So I mean, as we said, um, Neil and Neil, as in me and you, when that and did an interview earlier earlier this evening with with the brilliant Greg Cosell. Um, it was an honour. It was a bucket list for both of us to speak to one of the great minds in NFL and find his thoughts out on a multitude of different things. Neil, absolutely. This i've actually been nervous all week especially when they considered on monday my voice was even worse than this and i thought i was going to have to cry it off and leave it to neil leave it to neil yeah and obviously you know we ask him the standard nfl questions but of course it wouldn't be waxing the record without of means and thoughts if we didn't ask him you know if he enjoyed his uncle being played by john voight in the alley movie uh, it answers pe- these are the questions people are t- too afraid to ask. We'll ask them. Here is the interview with the brilliant Greg Cosell. And joining us now on What's in Lyrical with Maine and Duds, it's an honour and a privilege to speak to Greg Cosell. Uh, Greg is a, obviously, as everyone's aware, an NFL analyst and senior producer at NFL Films. He's widely regarded by NFL Insiders as one of the most knowledgeable and trusted football analysts, and we are honoured to have him on the show. How are we, Greg? Neil, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, no problem, no problem. I mean, Greg, we assume when we, we, we listen to you a lot on, on other podcasts. We, we, we obviously are aware of your work. You do a lot, a lot of stuff with the NFL. You were in Indianapolis for the Combine. How was it? How, how does it go, and how... How do you enjoy the Combine, or do you enjoy it? The Combine is actually my favorite event, Neil, because um, for me, I get a great chance to talk to a lot of different coaches, a lot of different personnel people. Everybody's relaxed because it's the off season, so they're not worried about a game. Uh, so for me, 
it's more of a way to talk to a lot of people than it is necessarily to watch the the college players. I do watch them, uh, but I, I find that I I get a lot more out of watching them actually play when I watch the college tape. But uh, the combine is is it's probably my favorite event of the year just because of the opportunity to really spend relaxed time with a lot of different people. When it comes to the the combine itself. Um... Greg, a lot of a lot of emphasis is put on like events like the forty time and the vertical jump. Are these like events that do you think they should be? They, every position should do them, or should there be some kind of reorganization, you know, to make them more relevant? Like I haven't seen too many offensive linemen who have to run forty yards, particularly. Right. Um, you know, it's funny, Neil. I think that. When all said and done, the, the combine is a piece of the puzzle. I think it's probably made more important by a lot of people simply because it's a televised event, whereas personnel people and coaches sitting in a dark room or sitting at their desk on a computer watching coaching tape is is not publicized, so it's not something a lot of people are aware of. Uh, when you have an event that's on TV for five, six, seven days consecutively, uh, people are very aware of it, and therefore they ascribe far more importance to it than people in the league. Um, there are certain uh, tests uh, that I think different people in the league would ascribe a, a more or less importance to. So I think it becomes a, a personal thing, a team-by-team team thing. Uh, so it's, it's a piece of the puzzle, and I think that's what's important to remember. With, with, with the work in Indianapolis, as you said, it's about talking to people, meeting people. Obviously going through uh, today, free agency goes from legal tampering, which is a, surely an oxymoron, to official free agency, do you think a lot of deals get done in Indianapolis? A lot of conversations, a lot of a lot of moves by by teams get in the get they get it done early under the table. Well, I think as in any business, Neil, there's there's backroom dealings that uh, always take place, and I'm sure that that happens. I don't know that I'm not part of that that uh, part, but uh, people are talking all the time in any business. And you know how it is. There's there's different ways that uh, uh, different uh, things are brought up. So I'm sure people are talking most of the time. It's look. We've had technically the the league year hasn't even uh, commenced yet. It doesn't commence technically for another 50 minutes uh, here on the East Coast, 4 p.m. Eastern time on the East Coast in the United States. And there's already been deals announced. Technically, they can't. They're not official yet, but they're done. Um, last, my last question about the combine: does, does you, the idea that you know football is a copycat sport? You know, if something works, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be copied. And you often hear in like, especially in college football, that you know, like when a new system comes in, like the wishbone or you know the spread, that this information will almost get shared amongst any coach who asks for it. Does that type of do these type of conversations like schematically go on at the combine between coaches, or is it? a closely guarded secret what the NFL offense will do? Oh, I, I, I think in the NFL, to be honest with you, I don't think there's many secrets at all. I think that you don't win in the NFL um, based on gimmicks. You don't win because you're doing things that other teams are unaware of. Uh, you know, I think people may think that. I don't think that's true at all. I think pretty much everybody knows what every other team is doing schematically and tactically, and you win because you execute really well, uh, or you you know you happen to call a play against an anticipated defense and you call the right play, uh, but you don't win because you trick people or because of gimmicks. That's not really what the NFL is about. So, so it, it's yeah, I, I've always believed that because I, I sit here and I watch a ton of tape. Teams have. 25 people doing this, so there's no surprises. Obviously, uh, big news in the NFL this week regarding Peyton Manning retiring. I'm, I'm interested, Greg, in, in you study quarterbacks um, extensively, obviously, given given the work you do. What is what may, what separated Peyton Manning before the snap that people talk about that the, 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 the average fan doesn't really see? Well, I mean, it's talked about a lot. They don't see it, but I think that his attention to detail and his work ethic, and he really even talked about that. Uh, you know, I think that that, I think his ability uh, to practically apply from the classroom uh, 
and the practice field to the the game on Sunday or Monday is was probably the best that anyone's ever been able to do. And I think that's at the end of the day, he talked about the fact that he's not the most talented guy, and and that's true. But I think his his practical application of concepts uh, from the field to uh, the practice field, the classroom to the field is just, I think that's probably unmatched. Do you think given the, the way that the quarterback position is, is evolving or changing, will there ever be another Peyton Manning? I know it's a big thing to ask and hard to put on anyone, but the type of player he was, and but the way, you know, that we have a lot more, a lot more quarterbacks come into the NFL that don't seem to be ready, whereas Peyton Manning was able to make adjustments as he went. Is it too much to ask someone to be the next Peyton Manning? Well, I think what's happened now, Neil, is is the game has changed to where quarterbacks are required to do more and asked to do more at the line of scrimmage. And in college, that's not the case. So, it, it's you kind of have to learn that as a college quarterback uh, when you get to the NFL, and it, that that's a, a process. People don't realize that there's an entire process in learning how to become an NFL quarterback. And I think what Peyton Manning did is is I hate to use the word revolutionized because I'm not necessarily a believer in that word, but clearly what he did was control the game at the line of scrimmage. And I don't just mean by by um, going up and playing fast because that's not just what he did. He went up and literally, based on what the defense was doing, would he might have two or three or four plays at his disposal and he would call the appropriate play based on the defense. So he really controlled and managed the game at the line of scrimmage. I think that trait is increasingly important in today's NFL because defenses with their situation substitution and with their different kinds of blitzes where they now get more secondary people involved in blitzes, I think it's just really, really important to have a quarterback that can control and manipulate the game at the line of scrimmage. So that that now is a significant part of NFL football. So... Um... You, you uh, obviously you do a lot of work uh, for PhiladelphiaEagles.com, dot com, you know, with the film room and all. Right, right. Um, I'd say I'm a for you know I'm an Eagles sufferer for want of a better word. Um, and Doug Peterson has come in this year with an offense that's been described as a West Coast hybrid. What exactly does that mean? And in your opinion, from what you know of that offense and what you know of him, is Sam Bradford a good fit for it? Well, I think we've now come to the point where a lot of these terms don't necessarily mean what they did years and years ago. Um, You know, I think that if you get to Sam Bradford, I think Bradford's a very accurate thrower. Uh, I think that he's he's a professional quarterback. I think he could probably play in any system. Um, I think he's probably better in a system that accentuates the short to intermediate pass game, which for the most part is what the, the, the so-called West Coast hybrid does. Uh, but you see the same route concepts in, in the West Coast hybrid in the Andy Reid offense, which Doug Peterson will now run, as you do in other offenses. Uh, there are certain concepts that pretty much everybody runs. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that uh, Bradford is a good fit. But what's interesting is they just signed today uh, Chase Daniel, the backup from Kansas City, to be the backup to Sam Bradford. Uh, and now there's a lot of talk in the last 10 or 15 minutes, just while we're talking, actually, Neil, that the Eagles still could have an opportunity to trade Sam Bradford. So we'll see how that plays out. Well, break, breaking news, Dalton. And also breaking news, Greg, it, I've just seen on across the wire that it seems that Brock Osweiler is going to leave Denver and move to the, the Houston Texans. Wow, that, that just came across, huh? Yeah, that's uh, uh, Ran Getlin uh, from NFL.com is, is is saying that. So, is that from from your point of view? Although obviously Denver won a Super Bowl, do you see that the fact that they Ben Sprock have after giving him some starts has affected that? And now he, he wants to be seen as the main man and do it on his own in Houston. Well. Look, I'm sure it's a money issue. Uh, He's he's going to a very good offensive coach in Bill O'Brien, so it's a very good move for Brock as well. Um, It's interesting to me from Denver's perspective because you could make the argument, Neil, that Denver won a Super Bowl without the quarterback, even though it was Peyton Manning, but without the quarterback being a significant part 
of their playoff run. So they probably felt to some degree that if the money got too high, that they were not going to pay that to Brock Osweiler. And they may feel, you know what, we can either draft a quarterback, we can go out and get a a backup type quarterback, and we can be okay because we essentially just won the Super Bowl playing that way. I, I obviously Dutton and, and yourself know a lot about the Philadelphia Eagles. I, I, I support a team um, in the same division, the Washington Redskins, and obviously they've just paid a lot of money for a, for a quarterback uh, for one year in Kirk Cousins and released what was seen to be the franchise quarterback a few years ago in um, in Robert Griffin III. Do you, from from the, the Cousins deal, do you see that one year uh, franchise tag as a good, a good deal for both sides because it gives... Washington an opportunity to get more game film tape, so to speak? Well, I think it's just business. I think they probably couldn't come to an agreement. Maybe they still will. Um, you know, they're with Kirk Cousins every day. Uh, he's He had a very good season. He had an, actually an outstanding season. Uh, but I'm sure there's still a sense that he's a quarterback that doesn't have a high level skill set so I'm sure they'd like to see if he can continue to do this they happen to have a lot of weapons offensively so it's a very good situation for Kirk Cousins um, you know and money is always is always relative it's funny you mentioned Kirk Cousins because I was asked recently by someone you know is Kirk Cousins a franchise quarterback and my response was relative to what you know that, that's that's a term that's overused. Uh, if you, if it's between Kirk Cousins and no, you know, and and let's say Colt McCoy, then you might think Kirk Cousins is a franchise quarterback. He's your quarterback, so it's always relative to what, because you've got to line up and play with a a quality NFL quarterback. There's not a lot of these so-called great ones, so franchise is is. It's an overused and at times meaningless term because it's just it's relative. I mean, is Andy Dalton a franchise quarterback? Well, Andy Dalton played pretty darn well for Cincinnati, and when AJ McCarron came in, even though he didn't play badly, they didn't play as well. Final couple of questions from us, Greg, and it's it's related to a a famous relative, um, <laughs> and that's that's your uncle Howard Cosell. He was correct me if I'm. Wrong. A, a legendary broadcaster in the states, obviously, and one of the first uh, color, first uh, play call commentator for the Monday Night Football when it was ori- originated in 1970. Um, did did your connection to Howard help or hinder your um, your job search when you when you got into the world of the NFL? Uh, that's a question. To be honest with you, I, I really can't answer because I kind of. I I did everything on my own. I don't know if if he was called by people who uh, I interviewed with, so that I don't know. Um, I always, from the time I was two years old, I loved sports. I would play out in the backyard with my father. I played high school sports. I played college sports. So I always loved sports. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to a really good college, so I learned how to write and do other things. But, uh, uh, you know, again, I, I didn't necessarily go to him for advice. It was a situation, Neil, where when Howard was in his prime, I was basically in junior high, high school, you know, a little bit of college. So I was kind of doing my thing. He was doing his thing. So it was, uh, even though he was my uncle there, you know, it's not as if we we spoke regularly. It was, you know, he was a busy guy. And and you know how it is when you're a teenager or, or in college, you're kind of doing your thing. Um, One of the big hypotheticals that people always get asked in any walk of life is, who would play you in the movie of your life? So, I mean, it it wasn't a movie per se about his life, but would Howard Cassell have been happy that John Voight played him? (laughs) I saw that movie. You mean the L.E. movie? Yeah. Uh, Boy, I don't I don't know. He, you know, he did a pretty good job, as I recall. I saw it when it, it's funny. I actually saw it here in Philadelphia because of Will Smith, who's who played Ali, is is a, a local Philadelphian. He's a native Philadelphian. I was invited to the premiere in Philadelphia. Now Will Smith couldn't make it; he was somewhere else. But they had a big premiere in Philadelphia, and I was fortunate enough to be invited. So I saw it when it came out, and I haven't seen it since. So it's tough for me to remember specifically. But I remember thinking he did a pretty good job. Well, Greg, it's 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 been an honour to speak to you, and we will let you get back to uh, to to your, to your day job. And obviously, listening to all the all the stories of all the free agents uh, moving teams. 
Well, no, I really appreciate it, and thanks. And what I'm doing now is I'm just uh, kind of preparing for the draft. I'm watching uh, college tape, so that's I kind of grind away on that now. Well, it, well, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy your watching, sir. Thank you. Well, Dutton, that was Greg Cosell, and that was a privilege and an honour. Absolutely. Um, as I say, that's that's been my my Everest, as it were. To try and speak, speak to uh, Greg, and now we've done it. So, so this is the final ever waxing lyrical. Um, no, it's not the final ever waxing lyrical. It's the final ever one with Dutton, who is now yeah. just gonna take a selfie with a gun. Yeah, that's it. I need to find news as well, Dutton. That's what I like. You know, he informed us, and we informed him. Exactly. It was a reciprocal agreement, and you know, I think, I think in the end, we can both go away happy that we've learned something. We have done, we have. So, Dutton, let's just continue with the free agency as it's going on all around us. As, we, as we've been on the phone uh, speaking to Greg Brock Osweiler, Sam with the Texans, we've seen Matt Forte, Sam with the, the Jets. He wants to be a winner. Um, okay, the contradiction in terms there somewhere, and I'm just trying to find it. Um, um, you've signed, you've signed a, a, a safety um, from St. Louis, who you'll probably give for a Give for no picks to Miami next year, but we'll get on to that. In terms of the teams, Dutton, biggest spender so far, Malik Jackson, um, is the Jags. Is Because they've got so much money spare, I'm not really sure how it works, but they just have. Is this a make or break period for the Jags in terms of the whole front office staying in a job next year? Well, the make or break for two reasons. One, Due to the fact that the NFL has a salary cap, the cap also has a floor. And what the floor is, you have to spend a certain amount of your money over a four-year period. You can't just keep it. You have to spend it. And this year has come to the fact that the Jaguars are well under that floor, so they do have to sign these players. So it's a question of even if they have to overpay for players, they can do it with very little very little pain further down the road. You know, this, these aren't, you know, like Baltimore with Flacco type contracts they're getting. They'll play, pay top dollar, but they will get these players in because they can afford it. From a, a playing standpoint, I think it's pretty much written in the start that this is the last go round for Gus Bradley and probably Dave Caldwell. If they can't push for the playoffs, I think eight and eight might do it. Anything above that will probably last get them another year, but it's time they have to start delivering on all the goodwill that they've accrued over the last few years. It, it basically they've been, you know, they've, they've they've shown little bits of development. But Bradley was brought in as a defensive coach. The defense needs serious adjustments, and that's why they're spending the money on it. In terms of the offense, they just brought Chris Ivory in from the Jets. I guess the question is from a fantasy perspective, how much does that hurt TJ Yeldon? It hurts him a lot. Um, Yeldon was was showing signs of being a true bell cow back. Um, he's a decent receiver. He's a good pass blocker. He was getting goal line work, especially since they, uh, they that looked like it was going to get better, especially with Toby Gerhardt being released. Now Chris Ivory comes in. And Ivory's for volume back. We know he's going to try and approach 20 carries, but very rarely get to them. It, this could be a true running back by rotation. And as we know, that's a fantasy killer, which is a shame because standing alone, both of them would have had value this year, whereas now they're coming to its, it's subtraction by addition. Neil, I'd like to give you a round of applause. Because the Philadelphia Eagles have won early free agency in the NFC again. Bravo, bravo. You are now the Philadelphia Dolphins. Well done. Congratulations. You must be so proud. Talk me through the deals and talk me through why you're going to tell me that all of them are good. Well, as I say, if we look at the numbers and not the names, basically the Eagles have have, have essentially dumped the salary of an, an overpriced cornerback an out of shape, out of sorts linebacker and a pass that running back, and they've managed to clear these off the books, open up a further nine, nearly ten million in salary cap, all the time whilst the returning GM sticks a knife 
in the remaining soul of the previous incumbent. So, Dutton, do you have to say previous incumbent? Because obviously you are the the Eagles, the Eagles writer for PhiladelphiaEagles.com in, in in the UK version, so to speak. So, because you basically work for the franchise, is it an unwritten rule that nobody is allowed to mention Chip Kelly's name anymore? He's been stricken from the record. I, I, the the Eagles essentially um, have had three years off. Um, I don't know where they've been do what they've been doing, but you know they've had a rest and they've come back as a new team. All I'd say is you need to see if you have if anyone saw the the um, gif or of um, of Conor McGregor walking walking to, walking through the hotel room. It's much like Vince McMahon in WWE. That's how I imagine Howie Roseman walking through the. Uh, through the through the corridors of, of Eagles Tower as he regains his rightful spot as head honcho. You not think it's more like um Leo in the Wolf of Wall Street? Wolf of Wall Street it could be, could be done. It it, it could be both of it. Just standing arms aloft, waiting for it, waiting for adulation. Does all the well, in serious though, in, in a Philadelphia sense, does this salary dump and removal of players give Give the Eagles a year's grace in terms of, oh, we're allowed to be rubbish because this year we've got to fix all that mess that we've had from the previous three. Um, it's it's tough to say. I mean, you'd, you'd have to assume that only an absolute major disaster would put this coaching staff under pressure after one season. Um, there's There were already good parts, especially on the defence. I mean, this is probably the first time in my time following the Eagles that I've felt a lot better about the defence than I have about the offence. Um, that was certainly aided by Jim Schwartz coming in. Um, so, I, 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 0-16, Mike Peterson might have to lose his job. But it, it's it's a bit weird. I mean, the, the thing that was initially made me uh, slightly concerned was the, the thought that DeMarco Murray and Ryan Matthews were both going to be on the, tra- on the uh, trading block now, it was odd when they both signed, but I thought personally it would have been odder to let them both go, considering that Darren Sproles, for all that he's done, is not a foundation running back. And to be fair, most people thought he was going to get cut by the Eagles anyway. Um, so I think that one is they need to add another running back in the draft or free agency, but it looks like most of the top ones are going to go, so they'll look to add in the draft. There's no point in taking the running back high. I mean, we know that one of the particulars of this trade is that the Eagles will move up from 13 to 8 in the first round. Well, I've already seen one tweet, I can't remember who it was, said they've gone that high to get Ezekiel Elliott. No, they haven't. If they have, I'll be absolutely stunned because there's no point in taking a running back in the top first 10 picks. You'll get you'll get Elliott at 13, so I'm not sure you go up from 13 to 8. No, get Elliot. It doesn't make any sense. I don't. I'm, to be honest, I have no idea what they've gone up. That's just, I think, just a product product of the deal with Miami. It may not actually be anything. If that makes sense, they've not. It, it, it comes as part of the the book balancing of the deal, rather mm. than rather than anything actually happening related to it. So they've moved up five places, but I'm not sure they've moved up five places to get anyone. Mm. Why I say that is because as we speak right now. Chase Daniel is on his way to Philadelphia to sign a contract with the Eagles. I said to you via text, I expect him to be a starter by week four. Do you expect him to play any games for the Philadelphia Eagles next year? Not next year, no, because I still think um, that Sam Bradford is, as we stand now, going into all the camps. He's penciled in as the starter. The interesting thing is that Sam Bradford has signed a two-year deal. Chase Daniel has signed a, it will be signing a three-year deal. Read into that what you will, but I still don't think... I think it precludes the fact... It precludes the Eagles from taking a quarterback at eight. Because let's be honest, what type of franchise takes a quarterback in the top ten of the draft and then drafts another one four rounds later? I'm looking at you, Paul. OK, sorry, yeah, we do that. Just, But that's just so that when one of them doesn't work out, you've got one that does work. But at least they're friends. Yeah, well, they're bigger friends than Brian Arapo is with Chris Cooley right now. Mm. If you haven't seen that tweet, find Brian Arapo's Twitter feed. That is an epic tweet. When can we expect the you know the grudge match tag team of Arapo and Rappaport against Cooley and Lackenfora? 
that laughing for a Rappaport thing, I, I, there's something's gone on there and there's alcohol involved. That's all I'm saying on the matter. Very, very strange. Final question on the free agents, do It's early and, you know, not in theory, no one's signed and legal tampons occurred or whatever. Do you, what deals have you seen and thought, yeah, makes sense that like it? Um, I like Marvin Jones to Detroit. Um, he's not going to be Calvin Johnson, but they don't have to be. He doesn't have to be Calvin Johnson. Last year, um, from week 10 onwards, by making Matthew Stafford's field shorter, he became he was the fifth highest scoring fantasy quarterback. And in terms of uh, standard scoring and PPR, Golden Tate was a, was a wide receiver too, despite having an average depth of target of 6.6 6 yards. That's essentially a long handoff. Um, so Marvin Jones comes in. They can, you know, they can still work that. They probably add another receiver in the draft, but they're not standing pat and saying, "Oh, Golden Tate will be fine." They are moving forward. Um, I like Alex Mack to the Falcons if that has happened, um, because their offensive line has been a joke for far too long. Um, for things that I like, ones I don't like. I mean, I like Travis Benjamin to the Chargers. I think he might have had a bit more value if he'd gone to the Falcons. I can't for the life of me understand why the Falcons are paying that much money. I think it's about $7 million a year for Mohamed Sanu. I honestly don't see the point. I, the most he's ever had in the season was five touchdowns. He's never come close to 1,000 yards. I don't see how he helps or takes away some you know, gives some welcome distraction to stop team screaming, to stop Julio Jones. But to be fair, it doesn't matter because you can't stop Julio Jones. Chris Ivory swapped for Matt Forte in New York. Is that deal only worthwhile if they get Ryan Fitzpatrick back under centre? They, I, I think so. Fitzpatrick, well, he's the last domino to fall now. Um, because let's be honest, the Jets are not going to trade for Colin Kaepernick. I can't see them signing Robert Griffin. <clears throat> they need fits in the building. And to be fair, on uh, Tuesday morning football, which I think I've hosted since the last time we did a podcast, they said that literally if Ryan Fitzpatrick goes and gets offered 15 million a year by someone and comes back to the Jets and they say 14, he'll probably take it. I assume you mean the Gridiron Show? Gridiron Show. Um, and my question is, that's a great story. Because when we expected that Brock Osweiler would sign with Denver. But if Ryan Fitzpatrick gets offered the three-year, $45 million deal that Denver allegedly offered Brock Osweiler, why the heck would you go to the Jets? Well, that's the thing. If they offer it, um, I mean, I'm sure John Elway sees a lot of himself in Ryan Fitzpatrick. I'm not saying, OK, bravo, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan Fitzpatrick was better last year than Peyton Manning. Um, I'm looking around my house to see people who weren't, and I'm struggling. So, what well, I'm saying is they need a QB now. They've gone from having two, in air quotes here, to having zero with Osweiler signing for the Texans. I like Osweiler signing for the Texans. Do you know who likes Osweiler signing for the Texans, Don? Bill Belichick. DeAndre Hopkins. Hmm. DeAndre Hopkins. You would assume, hopefully... But the thing we don't know about Brock Osweiler, is he any good? Mm. He played seven games. He may add four good halves. He's not spectacular. And that's why they only offered him three years, 45 in Denver. I have, I'm not too sure what the deal is in, in Houston. I haven't seen that yet. But I'm assuming he's going to get something like five for 80. Uh, I think it is pushing that. I mean, the thing is with Denver, I mean, to lose one quarterback is unfortunate. To lose two seems like carelessness. Maybe John, maybe John Elway can come back. They've just proven that they can win with Peyton Manning. Just get John Elway back on the centre. Or Brian Hoyer. You need to find someone. Don't, we're joking around here. <laughs> like, the Super Bowl champions have no QB now. And they've signed a load of money for Von Miller. They've still got that defence. They need to do something. Tebow? Just, this is comedy gold. Comedy gold. We will find out over the next week. And then we'll report back to see who's done something, who hasn't done anything, and wonder what Green Bay Packers fans do during this period of the season. Go away. Probably go just go to sleep. What's the point? Yeah, it's 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 a it's a waste of time part of the season. Well, this has been 
waxing their knuckle. We spoke to Greg Cosell. We talked about free agency. We've given you some stupid stories and told you never to take a selfie again. Unless you've got a gun. <laughs>